Well, good morning and welcome to the 13th annual John Perkins Lecture Series Chapel. My name is Christy Holt, and I am one of the many student volunteers for SPU's John Perkins Center, or JPC as we like to call it. And uh, in the John Perkins Center, we wholeheartedly believe that it takes God's work through community to seek justice, which is why we partner with community organizations both locally and globally to engage social change. And we also love to come together to eat, which is a really great thing when you're a student. And so I came to Seattle Pacific University to be a student of this university. But my engagement with the John Perkins Center has made me a student of the community and of the world. For me, it's been something like putting on a pair of glasses. I thought I could see just fine, but uh, it turns out I think I was as blind to the beauty and necessity of a diverse community as I was to the pain of injustice on my neighbors' faces. Now I'm a little excitable and some would even say hot-headed, so as I began to comprehend the implications of living in a racialized society, I was ready to speak out in anger. I wanted people, I wanted to force people really to, to see what I was just coming to see. And I wanted us to take accountability, responsibility. But uh, the example of the Reverend Dr. John M. Perkins leads us by a gentle and radical love that defies anger hatred, and division. His capacity to love not only his community, but his opposers and oppressors is a miracle to witness and reminds us in the JPC what Christian leadership is meant to be. So it is my prayer, especially today, that we are ready and listening to learn as a community. Our scripture today is from Galatians 2, 15 through 21. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing.
Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Perkins, and I kept asking God, what am I going to talk about today? You know, and two things kept coming back to me. And so I'm going to share two things quickly. The first I want to talk about is uh, something that stays on my heart. And the two things I'm going to share is, are the two things that are on my heart. And God says, share what's on your heart. So the first I want to talk about is uh, the youth in Jackson. And I'm going to tell you a quick story. In January, I got a phone call. It was over Christmas break, and it was from the Jackson Police Department. And I said, hello? And uh, they said, Ms. Perkins, we just found, we just uh, apprehended four kids breaking into the Perkins Clubhouse. And I was like, I, I got all upset. I was like, oh my goodness, what are they doing breaking into the Clubhouse? This is their Clubhouse. This is the community Clubhouse. Why? All they had to do is come and knock on the door. And, uh, and so he said, well, actually it was a she. She said, what do you want me to do with them? I can take them downtown, I could book them, and, um, and put them in juvie. And then I was thinking, yes, they, 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 need, a, they need to learn a lesson. <laughs> and so then I thought about they would come out of juvie worse. And so I said, well, how old are they? And she said, 12. 10, 8, and 4. My heart just sank. And they were all brothers and sisters. So I asked the officer, I said, well, t I'm still trying to be tough. But at that moment, I was like, real sad. I asked the officer, I said, uh, tell them, and I tried to say it out, to tell them next Tuesday they have to meet me at the center. And uh, tell their mom she have to be there. And I want them every Tuesday and Thursday to be there early to help us set up and help us clean up. And he said, okay, I'm going to tell them. And they have not missed a day since. The mother came that Monday, I mean that Tuesday, and she had another baby. It was six months old. So here's a lady with five kids who, we, you know, we're getting ready for our summer. We're getting ready for our summer camp. Here's a lady with five kids who are going to have four of them running the streets this summer. There's no way she can pay for summer camp. And so, um, one thing I want to ask you all, if you all are interested in helping fund this lady and other kids um, to, to go to summer camp, just uh, email me, give me a call, whatever. But let me tell you, we have 60 kids throughout the, throughout the year, and 15 will register for camp because the others can't pay. Now, that's what was on my heart. God told me, let the people know. To, uh, ask God and tell his people. And the other thing that was on my heart, second thing, quickly, I want uh, you all, some of y'all may have heard, and some of you may have not heard, but Daddy was diagnosed with cancer. And six days from now, he will go and get a biopsy to see if it's benign or if it's uh, malignant. But so the second thing I want to do is I want Dad to come up here and I want um, Tally and um, Meta and Milt and a, and a few people to come up and I want the rest of us to extend our hand to him and let's pray, let's pray for Daddy.
Father God, as we stretch our hands and our hearts toward this, our brother, our father in ministry, our role model, our elder, our friend, we ask you, Spirit of the living God, to fall fresh on him. We thank you, God, that he has lived his life in your presence for his entire adult life. He has sought to serve you and to please you. This is your son in whom you are well pleased. And it is our honor now to lift him before the throne of grace. Thank you for the tradition from which we come, Lord God, that truly believes in your amazing grace. Grace that confounds doctors. Grace that gives more than we can ask or think. Amazing grace that can do the impossible even in this stage of our lives. So we pray now, God, that you would wrap your arms around this man of God. That you, Spirit of God, would protect him, keep him, and surround him with peace. Guard him, we pray in the name of Jesus. Bless the work of his hands and the legacy, Lord God, that he has begun. Let these daughters carry it on and may many young people be influenced for the work of the kingdom of God because of John Perkins. So Lord, lay your hand on him, we pray, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. God, we are eternally grateful for the love that you have shown us through this man and his family. And it's for that grace that we ask that you would comfort, provide wisdom and direction, give insight to the doctors, strengthen Vera May, bless their relationship through this. And we pro pro proclaim and declare your goodness in the midst of it all, for a life well lived, for a legacy worth celebrating, for a man whose integrity is beyond reproach. And we say thank you, Lord, and give you all the praise and glory. In your name, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, it is good to be here with you all, and it's good to be here with John Perkins and Dr. Michael Emerson. Today, we have the opportunity to engage in a discussion together. Um, and just to provide a basis for, and I know many of you already know John, uh, but I would love to read from the jacket of his new book, One Blood, Parting Words to the Church on Race. John Perkins is the founder and president emeritus of the John and Vera Mae Perkins Foundation and co-founder of Christian Community Development Association. He has served in advisory roles under five U.S. presidents. He is one of the leading evangelical voices to come out of the American Civil Rights Movement and is an author and international speaker on issues of reconciliation, leadership, and community development. For his tireless work, he has received 14 honorary doctorates and a 15th one is on the way next week from Millsaps College. One Blood, along with Dr. Perkins' other books, provides an enduring legacy for a man who continues to leave his mark on American culture. Please welcome Dr. John M. Perkins. And for many years, SPU has read a book called Divided by Faith. Many in the church community have been benefited by the work of its co-author, Dr. Michael Emerson, the provost of North Park University. He has been gracious enough to join us today. And if, um, if you're able to, there is a panel discussion with Dr. Emerson at 1 p.m. in Upper Gwen. Join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Emerson. And John, interviewing you is, is, uh, is kind of like trying to herd cats because you're a preacher. Yeah. 
So we're going to try and do this, okay? Let me read just a, a, a little piece of your book here. There's an urgency about them, but the urgency is not only on my account. We have only to look at the signs of the times to realize that the church may not have long to get this right. We may not have much time left to offer the world a glimpse of this unity that will point the eyes of the watching world to the power of our great God. Yes, there's an urgency. Time is running out for all of us. But while we still have time, let's reflect on the heart of Jesus who prayed earnestly that his church might one day be one. This is what I want you, the church, to know. This is my manifesto. You have been called the father of the modern day reconciliation movement. You somehow decided in the midst of all of this to pen your manifesto. What pushed you, what motivated you to write this? created 
another and another race, and we had demonized that, and really it had become black and white. Re racial reconciliation is black and white. Race direction today, they demonize the slaves. They formulate them as less than human niggers. And then they color coded us. And I wasn't meeting many white folk who wanted to be called a racist. And so I was saying the way we do reconciliation in our community is just like saying to black folk, what they used to say to us, nigger, and now if you call a white man a racist, you are saying nigger, because nobody want to be that one. And so I could see that this wasn't work, and I've been in for 50 years, and we went around in a circle. And I was beginning to say, we got to go back and affirm, do first thing first. We got to affirm that God created us the human race to represent him. And it wasn't two races or three races, but one race. That's a big error, and I don't know whether or not God can bless that. And that's the proposition from which I'm working on, and really saying that we all bleed the same. We are one race, that's one God. No, one mediator between God and man, and that man is Christ Jesus. And that nothing could wash our way out. And so we were sinning. I saw what we were doing is somewhat sinning. And we need to confess that sin and get that forgiveness together. And then let's live out this life that God called us to. That seems to be like a conclusion of if my people that are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways. And the wicked ways is us demonizing each other. It's really creating another God, another representative of God. Human beings here represent God, and we was creating another representative of God. But we'd also broke that in between black and white in society. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what helped me to do, and that's what one blood is. Mm -hmm. It's trying to say that uh, there's one God, there's one media, there's one human race, and that race needs to be reconciled mm -hmm. back to God. And then we become the agents then of reconciliation here on earth. But if we don't have that right, we miss it. That was the reason, that's a long story. <laughs> so it, it means that you really got to read, yeah. you really got to read one blood. Yeah, you really, you really. <laughs> and as we were perusing it last night, one of the things that, uh, and I, I loved how you said it, the, the way we've been talking about this uh, is instead of casting out demons, the church is taking part in making demons yeah. by demonizing each other, which comes through this word, John, that Divided by Faith brought out, which is racialization. And I love the way you said it last night. You said, divided by faith told us our religion was bad. That's, what I, that's exactly what I just said. <laughs> And he came along and he said, what he did was, I said it in Ebony, and he translated it into English. <laughs> and so you got, you, got the, you, got the, you got the English version, and you got the... The Mississippi Ebony and, version. And Ebony version. Dr. Emerson. <laughs> what am I supposed to follow up with that? I don't know. <laughs> First of all, I feel like an intruder on an uh, important man. Second of all, I'm really honored to be here with you all, but specifically with Dr. Perkins. He's had an immense influence on my own life, and uh, we're trusting God's going to heal you. We believe in that, yes. Um, because of the works I read of Dr. Perkins in about mid-1990s, our family living uh, a very white life in a suburban area of a very white metropolitan area, felt a calling from God to completely change our lives in every way, which that calling has remained now for 23 years. It meant we moved, it meant we switched churches, it meant we switched schools for our children, ultimately it meant new places of employment. And the call from God was this, you will live until I tell you otherwise as the racial minority, you and your family, that simple. 
Out of that came a massive culture shock and out of that came uh, a writing of a book called Divided by Faith because we were interviewing at that time white Christians and black Christians, evangelicals, and I just could not believe how completely different they talked about their face. Here we are supposedly having the same faith, but we did not have the same faith. And so if there is one God, how could there be two faiths? And I, I think John said last night we have a, it's, it's a flawed religion then, a flawed religion. So the question is, you know, 1 Peter 2.10, you were not a people, but now you are a people. That's our call, that's our goal. Uh, I know we'll talk about this in a moment, but that this man is stuck with it decade after decade after decade, whether it's popular or not popular, whether it's uh, seemingly to be successful or not at all, he never wavers. It's a true testimony for us. And, yeah. yeah. So why, why have you, why have you stuck it out with evangelicals? I <laughs> deal would be that I found Christ in the midst even of that flaw. I heard the good news of the gospel. And I, it sort of sounded like this when my three-year-old son came home from a good news club where whites and black young children had been uh, meeting together. And I was born in Mississippi and had moved to California. And they were singing something that I had never heard before. It sounds absolutely different in the midst of the racialized society I come from. And that was this little song. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red, brown, and yellow, black and white. They all are precious in his sight. And we were living in an apartheid church. And the church was holding up and overriding and guiding that misguided system. And I heard the truth for the first time in my life. And it was in that, you might call, that evangelical community that I heard the truth of God. And now I think I'm committed to understanding that evangelicalism. Uh, I think it comes from those angels that appear, this host of angels, that's where it come from, who was singing to the shepherds. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. Born to us to born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And what we've done is wrapped around our own political ideals around that central message. And of course, the new election showed that that political wraparound was more important than the sense of the, the message, and especially how we should live. And that, that, that shows the blindness that we're in today. And so I think the message of evangelicalism is still there. But we gotta penetrate and go through that. I think the only thing that can penetrate that is the word of God and love. I think the word of God and love and forgiveness. Now that's the other thing we have lost we have lost where sin is made, and so we are not so apt to ask for forgiveness. Sin is made in us individually. The lust of our flesh, the lust of our eye, and the pride of life. And I think that we don't want to be equal with God. We really want to be God in our society. And so I think that's where we are. And boy, I think though we had a good place. I think there's a whole group of people today is trying to be intentional and carry out the original Great Commission. And that's the way revival started 
it start with us obeying God at any time and turning to him and he'll forgive our sin and we get a new beginning in life. So I really think we had a good play because we're in such a dark place. And, and I believe that many of the churches now that's intentional planting, obeying the Great Commission first, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole totality of humanity. And, and I think that's always an option. And I think that's what revival is all about. So I think we had a really dark place, but we also had a good place to repent and obey God. And then he guarantees that we confess our sin, that he's faithful and he's just to forgive us our sin. And then we have this kind of revival, this kind of a intention of going out, affirming people's dignity and loving them like God wants to love. I think we got a good place. It, it, this is good news, this is not bad news. It's only bad news if you don't understand what I've said before. <laughs> but, but the, and, and so, it, 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 it's, this is good news. I, I talk like this sometimes and people, this, the gospel, that's what it is. That's the name of it. And it's good news of great joy if we obey. I think the most fundamental thing I've learned, John, in the last 25 years is your reality and my reality are fundamentally different on the very thing you're talking about, that you get up every day having to defend your dignity, to defend your humanity. I get up every day and I know that I'm human. And feeling guilty about it. Yeah. I, I meet so many people today is feeling guilty and can't figure out what to do with their guilt. Will you confess that too? And that because guilt means you're guilty. And you're really acknowledging. And that's what confession is, to say to God what you know and what God already know. And then God know you know it. And boy, you're going to get something going here. That's confession. And that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing. Yeah. There it is. Yes. Is there, uh, John, you get, uh, and Dr. Emerson, I'd love to, to hear what you think about this as well, to, I work with a lot of young people, a lot of millennials, and they're struggling with this notion of reconciliation. How can we reconcile with people who have, we have never been connected to? And I, we've had discussion about this in our, um, in our conversation over the last few months. What do you say to that? I mean, I know what I have to make up sometimes in the middle of a, talking to young people, but as John, as someone who's done this for 60 plus years, what do you, what do you say to that? I think it all starts with the, uh, with the individual. It all starts with seeking. I guess the big question I'm trying to use and think of how do we create within people, within me first, the passion to enter into that kind of ignorance and pain in that addiction to self that we're talking about. How can I enter into that world? How can I enter into that? And, and one of the things that I'm saying now, uh, in addition to our religion, we tied a prosperity theology on it, and we eliminated pain. And pain is, is the way to passion. Pain is when you take on others' pain. That's what the story of the Good Samaritan is about. And that's the $64,000 question, is how do I find the passion? How do I identify with other people's pain? And that's the greatest call in the Bible. The greatest call in the Bible, uh, I'm understanding, is when Jesus said, after they had almost forsaken him, and he had did his best preaching there, he says, come unto me, all of you that are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And so then, how do we get that? How do we create that concern for others? And it's only in that concern that we can find a passion. But we are wrapped around, again, ourselves. And we're wrapped our political ideas around ourselves. 
Now we're wrapped the prosperity religion around that. And so it's hard, and what that, that is addicting and it's leading to genocide. Black folks are killing black folk by handgun in the cities of the United States and you can't get your hand around them. White folks are killing white folks with machine guns and they're going into schools and churches and concerts in this self wraparound. And it makes these young folk, they feel like they're being cheated. They, they've been cheated and they're angry and they're being addicted. And that addiction is to themselves. So we got to help people to look away from themselves and look back to Jesus, who is the Redeemer, and then get the gratitude they need out of that redemption. And now we can be, and he gave us that mission of reconciliation, carrying this gospel to others. Reconciliation is the mission. Reconciliation is bringing people back to a relationship to God and then a relationship with each other. And the only way all that can happen is they gotta be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. That's what I'm trying to, this is an overlay of what I'm not trying to say. I'm trying to cut through all this chest that we done wrapped ourselves around. This diction, this self, uh, genocide in our society and put our focus again back on Jesus and his redeeming love and his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sin. So young evangelicals of color that are rising up the ranks as leaders will say, we can't talk about reconciliation. We gotta talk about white power, white domination. That's what has to be addressed. Oh, well, that, and, and that, we, it, it's a grassroots. It's grassroots, it's grassroots, because you gotta keep in mind that the black shirt is an expression of white oppression. Black folk didn't go out and say, uh, we started the church, that would have been against the law. They were run out of the church. And they created this system. That's why we gotta do it together. We black gotta, con just like I did in that Brandon jail when I was being tortured. I saw that my solution to the problem would have been a hand grenade. I got to pull a plug on. I saw the white folk problem, but I didn't see my own. In that jail, I saw my solution was just as bad as the white folk. So we have bought into the lie ourselves. We believe separately the way we believe. And it's difficult for us to find the passion to forgive each other. Because we don't have a language of, of dignity. We don't have that the human race is worth saving and that Jesus died for the human race in our society. And we don't took up our individualism and wrapped it around with this lie. We need to go back to the Bible and it's there, pretty clear in the Bible. But we have made the Bible say what it is we want it to say in our society. And that's what the young people are rebelling against. That's what the young, it's the same as, uh, I read this one, when Mark, Stalin, and Lenin, Lenin and Stalin in that group all of them say they had memorized the New Testament. And they found out that the Tsar Russian Orthodox Church was the chaplains to the Tsar. They was chaplains for their own oppressed system. We are moving almost there now. I'm a Republican, Democrat, teapot, and all of that tea party and all of that, all of that is a wraparound and think that that brings value to Christianity. And then we have established hate as the most powerful force. It is certain. It is certain. Love is the most powerful. But hate, hate your enemy. That's the way you do it. 
And, and we don't bought into that because our political idea, I would do better, but he's in power. Or my party's in power. Or my state is in power. A red state, a blue state. And all of that is what we are taking into us. We need to come back and get on a solid foundation. I like the little hymn, on Christ the solid rock we stand, all of the ground, you know what he said? All of the ground to enhance quality of life that Jesus said he came for. I've come that you might have, we even asked question in that. We asked him question I do. To black, a little boy, a black boy running from a policeman and say, black lives matter too. Most of my white friends say, Sir, what are you talking about? Well, all lives matter. That's what it is. That's a non question. That's a foolish question. That's what he blew breath, life into Adam and he became a living soul. To ask that question is what we are doing. Asking questions that don't count. That don't count. Does life, black life matter? Does white life? And we run around fighting about that in life. All life matter. And, and he gave unto us eternal life for this first death life. Boy. That's what Christianity is. That's the message. And so our Christianity is becoming more folklore. More of what somebody else said, somebody else said, that would benefit us. That's why we got to come back to the Word of God and, and expect the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to enlighten us how to love each other. And that's what he says the evidence of Christianity was, is how we love each other. Because love is of God. He that loves is born of God. He that loves not knoweth not God. Because God is love. Amen. Well, Doc, you... <laughs> in, in closing, in closing, you've never shied away from controversy, <laughs> obviously. But in closing, let me read this little bit from your book, and then we'll have the benediction. Yes, my steps are a little slower now, but my spirit is energized. I still have joy. I am full of hope for the future. We will get there. We will get there together. We will get there as one. Join me in thanking these gentlemen for participating in this. Thank you. Why don't you please remain standing for the benediction. Thanks. And once again, I want to extend my thanks to Dr. Perkins, Dr. Emerson, Tally, Elizabeth, Priscilla, the Gospel Choir behind me, and our student leaders for leading us in our worship today. Our benediction comes from Psalm 67. And Dr. Perkins, uh, if you would allow us, allow me to extend this benediction to you personally and then to all of us. Almighty God, be gracious to John and bless John and heal John and make your face shine upon John. Almighty God, be gracious to us and bless us and make your face shine upon us that your way may be known upon the earth and your saving power among all nations. Empower all the peoples to praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Enable all the peoples to praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And we ask you to continue to bless John. We ask you to continue to bless us so that all the ends of the earth will worship you 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for coming.